teacher that people don't really take seriously. Um, but uh, but uh, that's kind of how I felt for a second there. But anyways, um, tonight we're going to be talking, we're going to continue our uh, discussion and our studies on the days of Elijah. Um, we're going to be focusing, focusing specifically on 1 Kings 21 and 2 Kings 1. And the main theme of this study tonight is the goodness and severity of God. And we're going to talk about that. Um, as we go um, through this lesson. And you're going to see in, in these two events, in these two separate chapters, that is going to be a, a common theme. And we're going to kind of break down what that looks like here. We're going to talk about what that looks like in our lives today um, amidst some other life applications that I think are really, really important as we go through these chapters. Um, before we start the study, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us that we have had set aside to come together as those of like faith and to study from your word. Lord, as we go through this class tonight, we pray that you will please help us to take the things that we learn from the life of Elijah and apply them to our lives. Lord, as we focus on your, both your severity and your goodness, we pray that you will please help us to have open hearts about what both of those things mean and how we can see both of those things in our lives today. Lord, we thank you so much for your son Jesus who gave us the gift of salvation that we can have through him. and pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so um, just to kind of catch us up to speed, because we did miss a couple events from the last class, which I believe was 2 Kings 19. Um, 1 Kings 19, excuse me. As we go into 1 Kings 21, there's some things that we miss in chapter 20. And we're just going to breeze through this real quick. In chapter 20, we see a conflict between Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and Ahab. And Ahab actually defeats Ben-Hadad not once, but twice. And interestingly enough, Ben-Hadad is released by Ahab upon the condition of restoring cities from previous conflicts between Syria and Israel and allowing Ahab to establish these bazaars in Damascus. The issue with this was is that God said to Ahab, I commanded, he commanded him to destroy Ben-Hadad. But Ahab, as he usually does, um, has himself in mind and he lets Ben-Hadad go. Um, instead of destroying him. And obviously, as you can imagine, there were some issues caused by this. So as punishment, because of this, God lets Ahab know through a prophet that Ahab and his people would be destroyed in Ben-Hadad's place. And as we see so often in the life of Ahab, as we head into chapter 21, at the end of chapter 20, it says that Ahab was vexed and sullen. And I, fig I think it's fitting just to call it like it is. He's pouting. I mean, this is a grown man that was just pouting. And you're going to see Ahab pouting a lot. And this brings us into the account of Naboth's vineyard. So this is 1 Kings chapter 21. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 21. And as we go through this passage and through both of these chapters tonight, really be on the lookout for the goodness and the severity of God. We're obviously going to talk about those things, but just kind of be thinking about that because this is the overarching theme of this class. And the first section is verses 1 through 16, and this tells us about an evil and sad act of greed. And we kind of know, um, I'm not going to give the spoiler, but you kind of know um, why this is so sad and how it results from greed. I, will, I do want to make the point that as we go through these accounts tonight, um, we don't have time to stop and read all these passages um, word for word. Um, we won't be reading every single verse. We will have certain passages that we do read, um, obviously. But for the sake of time, most of these narratives will just be walking and talking our way through them so we have time to make the life applications we need to because I think that's where the real meat of this is um, as we go through this. So let's jump into it. Um, so at the beginning of this chapter in verse 1, a man named Naboth in Jezreel, he made a, he made a grave mistake. He, uh, he just owned a vineyard beside Ahab's palace. He really messed up by doing that. You know, it's not his fault, um, but he was just wrong place, wrong time. And Ahab, of course, because he's always got himself in mind, he wants this vineyard, and he offers a better vineyard to Naboth or just money worth the amount of value of the vineyard. And Naboth just says, I can't do it. I cannot do that because the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father's. This vineyard was important to Naboth. He didn't want to give it up. And, and I think that, you know, you can see that kind of in our culture today was in places like Spring Hill, these big corporate places come in. They want to buy the farmland, you know, from these farmers. And the farmers say, I don't want your money. I don't care about your money. This place means more to me um, than any amount of dollars. And I think you kind of see this in Naboth. And that's a, a pretty cool sentiment that we see there. But as we know, um, this is not going to end well. Um, because Ahab responds by being, there it is again, vexed and sullen. Yet again, grown man, king of Israel, pouting. He's pouting. Let's just call it what it is. He's pouting. And he proceeds to lay in bed and refuse to eat. And, I mean, you want to talk about a man-child. 
I mean, he literally lays in bed and refuses to eat. And in walks Jezebel. She's going to make everything better, right? Jezebel always improves the situation. Who, once she has seen the whole and heard the whole story from Ahab, she tells him, you know what? I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it, and this vineyard is going to be yours. And before we go to that, I do want to make the point that these two really make a dangerous combination, don't they? I mean, they, they really do. A weak-minded, pouty, immature man-child with the power over an entire nation and the power that comes of being a king being controlled and manipulated by a wicked, evil, spiteful woman who was not afraid to enforce her husband's power on her behalf. This is scary. This is a really, really scary dynasty um, that they have built up. And as we move forward, how Jezebel kind of takes care of this is she's going to forge a letter pretending to be Ahab to the leaders of the city there in Jezreel that Naboth lived in, commanding that Naboth be falsely accused of cursing God and the king. And that obviously is not going to be tolerated very well. If you do something like that, you're going to be killed. And all of this comes to pass. This exact plan works out. Naboth ends up being accused of this thing that he didn't do, and he's killed in cold blood all because Ahab wanted this vineyard and decided to pout when he was told no. And Jezebel comes back to Ahab and tells him that Naboth is dead now and and his vineyard is there for the taking. And so Ahab, refusing to eat for days, pouting and pouting, he gets up and he goes down to take it. He's fine now because he's gotten his way. And Ahab, there's just something about Ahab that just kind of makes you feel sick. Doesn't it? I mean, this is a this guy is just you're just like, oh, dude. Like it, it just it just gives you he gives you the heebie jeebies just because he's he's weak, but he has the strength and the power of a king. And it's just this this feeling that is that you can't shake when you study about Ahab. And coming off the back of this, I think it's important to keep in mind what literally has just happened to Ahab in chapter 20. Ahab literally had just disobeyed God by releasing Ben-Hadad just so he could have some more power and more land. And he's told by God through a prophet that that his people would be destroyed. And how does he respond? By wanting more and doing whatever it takes including killing a man to have more. And you're talking about a guy here, Ahab never learns, does he? He he never learns. And I think, I do want to ask the question, what do we learn about both Ahab and Jezebel from this account? What do we learn about them from this? They will do anything to get what they want. Anything to get what they want. And this account really does paint the picture for who these two people are as individuals and as a couple. This really sums it up. And you can already start seeing, yet again, our class is entitled The Goodness and Severity of God. You can kind of see where the severity of God is about to come into play with these two because they are wicked and they are evil and they are doing some really, really bad things, which is in steps Elijah. Elijah comes back into the picture here. Elijah's kind of been left out of the narrative the last chapter and a half And here he comes in to bring this charge of judgment. So God comes to Elijah and commands him to come out of hiding from Ahab and Jezebel and take a message to Ahab on his turf, sitting in the very vineyard he had committed murder to gain. And I think it's important to highlight just how much faith God is asking of Elijah here. Let me ask you, do you remember where where was the last place that we saw Elijah before this? What would have been the last thing that we would have seen with him? Prophets of Baal, okay. So he has stood up to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It's been this grand event, and he's had this great victory. But then then what happens? Jezebel, yeah, exactly. He, he runs, and he's hiding. So he, he is hiding, and it literally says, you know, he had been hiding in a cave, essentially, in this mountain. And now here comes God and says, Elijah, it's time. I need you again. And not only do I need you to just go talk to anybody, I need you to go to the doorstep of Ahab and Jezebel, these people that you have been hiding from, and tell them, hey, guess what? Judgment is coming. And I, 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 don't, I hope that's not lost on us, how much faith Elijah has in this moment to go do this. Um, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute when we get to our life applications. And to kind of further the faith of Elijah in this situation, the message that God tells him to deliver is not one that's very light so to speak. I do want to read this. I want to read verse 19 because this is, what, this is what God tells Elijah to do. And you shall say to him, now I want you to think, yet again, keep in mind, Elijah has 
been hiding from these people because they hate his guts. Okay, they do. They, they want nothing more than Elijah to be dead. And God says, okay, Elijah, come on out. You've got to go and you've got to deliver this message to them. And I can only imagine when Elijah hears what God wants him to say to them, I can imagine how I would be feeling, the anxiety that would come over me. As he says, you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick up your own blood. Wow. So you're telling me that now, not only do I have to come out of hiding, I've got to walk to these people's doorstep and I've got to tell them that? Think of the faith that that Elijah had to do this. And and yet sometimes we're afraid to speak out on behalf of the truth and God's standard. And we're going to talk about that here just a little bit like I was saying. And in this moment, Ahab responds with a very bold statement in the form of a question. At the beginning of uh, verse 20, Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? Almost like saying, Ah, here you are. You've come to me. And And Ahab doesn't want it to be lost on Elijah here. I don't think that I've let you off the hook. Don't think that I've let you off the hook. I I still hate your guts. And and you do feel like this was kind of an intimidation tactic. And think here at this moment what Elijah would be feeling. There would be the temptation to pull some punches. Be like, "Uh, I've come here to tell him this message, but then he comes out and says that, and it's like, oh, he turns out he hasn't forgotten about killing all those prophets of Baal. (laughs) That was still kind of a big deal to him. But he didn't. Elijah responds by not only condemning Ahab with the judgment that will come from God, but he says, you know what, I've got some judgment to give on behalf of Jezebel too. Finishing up verse 20 there through the rest of this section, he answered, this is Elijah, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut you off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat and any one of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. And I want to ask, are you starting to see the severity of God in the face of wickedness? Are you starting to see the severity of God? And in this moment, we kind of have a turn. And Ahab kind of has a surprising response to this. And, And... this isn't really a question I want you to answer out loud, but I want you to think to yourself, how, how would you expect Ahab to respond to this? Just knowing what you know about Ahab, how would you expect him to respond to this? I'm going to tell you, I, I would expect him to either pout or go and tell Jezebel, do whatever it took to have Elijah killed right here. And the next couple of verses almost give us that exact context. We kind of get a comment on Ahab's character in verses 25 and 26. Starting in verse 25, says, there was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. Let me ask you the question, why do you think that's there? Why do you think that that, little parent, that section in parentheses is here in this narrative? It was a really savage prophecy. Yeah. And it bears why. Yes. There, it's almost like in, in the scripture here, it's like, I just need to remind you why the severity of God is coming into action here. I need to remind you of who Ahab really is. And also, I think, to show us that, yes, you should expect Ahab to retaliate in a wicked way, or, or maybe you just give the impression, just to give us the impression of how evil Ahab was, is kind of what we were talking about. But Why? And I think it's so we can see the change brought about through the severity of God, which is where we get to in the next passage. Ahab responds to Elijah's delivery of God's condemnation by tearing his clothes and fasting in sackcloth. And you might read that and you say, ah, Carson, he's just pouting again. And that's that's what this is. It's just him pouting because he's been told off. And, And I can see where you would think that. But what do we see God say in verse 28? And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring disaster upon his house. God says, 
it might look to us maybe like he's just being vexed and so on again. He's pouting, but God, God comes out and says, no, Ahab, this wicked, evil, abominable man, he's humbled himself before me. He's humbled himself before me. And he responds by telling Elijah that because of his Ahab's humility, he would not bring disaster in his days, but in his son's days instead. This is where we see the goodness of God in action. Off the heels of the prophecy that is, like I said, this is not light, this message that Elijah is bringing to him. This is, you, all these awful things are going to happen to you because of your wickedness. And that severity causes Ahab to have, even if just for a moment, because we know it probably didn't stay that way, it caused him to have a moment of humility before God. Seeing the goodness of God in contrast and as a result of the severity of God. So let's get into the life applications. The the first set of life applications on this slide, I I do want to focus on some that are not centered around the goodness and severity of God because there's some good stuff in here. I obviously want to spend most of our time talking about the goodness and severity of God, but there's some good applications in here, I think, for us that are kind of outside of that that I want to touch on. The first one is greed, envy, and negative emotions are powerful and dangerous motivators. And We see this throughout Ahab's reign with with him and Jezebel, and we see it in our world today. But I don't want you to think about this only on the grand scale of world leaders and wars and all those sorts of things. This applies personally to your life, too. You can cause great damage by acting on these things in your life. If, if If greed and envy and all these negative emotions are what drives you, you can cause a lot of damage. You don't have to be president of the United States. You don't have to be a dictator. You don't have to be a world leader with these qualities. You don't have to be a king like Ahab. These qualities, if you let them motivate your decisions, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. And another point, another life application is, is that God might call us to go stand on the enemy's doorstep and tell them they're wrong. And that's scary. And the question we need to be able to ask ourselves is, will I respond like Elijah and go. This is something that we are commanded to do. Stand for the truth, even when it might be against those who could harm us, even when they try to intimidate us, even when it might be with someone we have tried to talk to about Jesus in the past, and they hate us now because of it. We have to have the believing heart of Elijah that I can go again and trust that God will be with me. And and one of the biggest lessons from this whole study of the days of Elijah is every single time that God said, Elijah, I want you to go. And Elijah went every single time. And and there's just so much power in the faith of Elijah amidst the fear that he could be facing. And I think that that there's great, great faith, and that is such a good example for us. And I want to shift now to the severity of God and the goodness of God when it comes to the life applications from this section. I hope we realize through this account that the severity of God is seen in the presence of sin. And like I said, we see it in this account. We'll see it in the next account in 2 Kings 1. We see it all through Scripture, and we see it today. God hates sin. God punishes sin. The severity of God exists in the presence of sin. And I hope that the lesson for us there is we cannot ever take sin lightly and become desensitized to it. And the severity of God in Scripture should always be a reminder of the severity of sin. In a world where we are being asked to become desensitized to sin, I hope that we never lose the severity and the damage that sin actually brings about. And it doesn't have to be the Old Testament in days of prophets and kings to to see that. We can see it in our lives today. The severity of God is seen in the presence of sin. And God's judgment is one of severity. It is not light. We saw that in this account with what he, the judgment that was going to come upon Ahab. And when you read narratives like this one, I want to ask you the question and just think about this. Do you come to the conclusion that God is going to allow anyone and everyone into heaven when you read accounts like this? Do you come to the conclusion that those who live a lifestyle of sin will not be punished? Because I don't. I don't. I see a God who unleashes wrath on those who choose sin over him. But we see a religious culture today that tries to push this version of God that is not this way, this soft, it's kind of what I call it, this soft version of God that allows sin to run amok in the lives of those who serve him. 
You know, yes, He is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of love, as we're about to talk about. But He is also a God of severity who will punish sinful lifestyles and punish those who are actively choosing sin over Him. And yesterday, I feel like it was really timely in our men's class, we were talking about faithfulness, and someone made the comment, and I think this is spot on, and we were talking about how God being faithful, we always associate that with the goodness of God. And that is, that is absolutely true. But God being faithful means that He is loyal to His standard. And a faithful God is also a God of severity because it means He upholds His standard. And I hope that we never lose sight of that. Just because God is severe does not mean that He is faithful. And in fact, God being severe shows that He is faithful. And I hope we see from this account that the severity of God is necessary because it causes change. And not always, obviously. Some have hardened hearts who aren't moved by God's severity, but God's severity in a heart that still has somewhat of a semblance of care for him does lead to change. And we see that even in Ahab. Isn't that crazy? That we are just told how awful Ahab is, and then he humbles himself before God. Even Ahab, in his wickedness, was moved to humility. A trait we really had never seen from him, ever. In the face of the severity of the Almighty God, and I hope that you see the power in that. And today, have you seen the severity of God cause change? Maybe in your own life, maybe in the lives of others. I mean, I, I've seen it in mine. And, and we do need to realize that, yes, there is a right and wrong way to go about bringing the gospel to others. There is, and that's kind of what these series of lessons, like I talked about this morning, we're kind of going to be talking about. But there comes a time where we might need to bring and show the severity of God and His Word to someone who is lost. Because guess what? The state of their soul, the lost soul, that is severe. It is. It's urgent. And they might need to see the severity of God to cause change. And if even for a moment it caused Ahab to change, then I believe that it can cause that person maybe in your life who needs to see that, that they need to change too. Ahab was as bad as it gets, and the severity of God led to even for a moment, even for a brief moment, led to change. And then we see that the goodness of God is seen in the presence of a humble heart. God's goodness was shown in withdrawing some of this wrath and punishment against Ahab in the presence of Ahab's humility once he shows that he was humbling himself before God. When we show humility and a willingness to change through that humility, that, that's where the goodness of God really does shine through. And yes, Jesus gave himself on that cross, and God gave him up on that cross for everyone. And those who might never humble themselves before God, those people might not change. But those are the same people that Jesus was on that cross for. And that alone shows the goodness of God. But the saving power of God's grace and mercy through His goodness will not be seen in action without a heart humble enough to accept that grace and mercy and the action necessary to pursue it. And the last point in this life applications here is that the goodness of God is truly felt in the presence of His severity. This is something I really want you to dwell on and really want you to think about tonight. The goodness of God is truly felt in the presence of His severity. This is perhaps the main, main point of this Bible study tonight. What makes God's goodness in this account so powerful? Because of who Ahab was and the punishment that he was heading towards. So what makes God's goodness so powerful today? When I look at it through the lens of my life, the power and weight of God's goodness can be felt when I hold it up to where I would be without it in the face of His severity. That I most certainly do deserve, by the way, and which is most certainly justified because of my sin against Him. Do you see the importance of the severity of God when it comes to the goodness of God? And that's one of the main things I want you to get tonight from this account, these accounts in, in First and Second Kings. Do you see the importance of the severity of God when it comes to the goodness of God? I hope you do. I hope you do, because that's a powerful sentiment that we, that we need to be able to grasp. Any comments, any, any things anybody wants to add before we move into the, this second account here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1? Anything anybody want to add? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. Our influence matters and it makes a difference and it has an impact for good or bad. For good or bad. That, that's a really good point. Anybody have anything else about this section here? All right, let's move into 2 Kings chapter 1. And, th- and this is where we shift into Ahaziah's reign. So we skipped something, right? We skipped chapter 22 of 1 Kings. And just to kind of catch us up here on what we missed, in 1 Kings chapter 22, we finally see Ahab meet his end in battle as his blood was licked up by dogs, as God had spoken would come to pass. Now you might be asking, didn't we just read about how God said, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring disaster on his house. And let me tell you how I would respond to that. God actually did withhold all of those. Like God said, all of these things are going to happen to you, and not all those things happen once he humbled himself before God. God did allow his lineage to continue ruling in Israel for a small amount of time, which was against what originally God had said before Ahab had humbled himself. And instead of Ahab's blood being shed on Naboth's vineyard, we actually do see that God brings the blood of Ahab's family through Joram's blood on Naboth's land in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 25. That's a cool little tidbit that, that I found there as I was studying that I hadn't really noticed before is God actually kind of, you know, he kind of withdrew the fact because of Ahab's humility. Your blood was actually not shed on Naboth's vineyard, but in a way his blood was because of his descendants that were. And now Ahaziah, Ahab's son, is going to take over the kingdom of Israel. And we read here in 1 Kings 22, Ahaziah, not great. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father has done. So in line with our lesson's theme tonight, I'm sure you can tell what is probably going to be coming Ahaziah's way. The severity of God. It it is coming his way. And in this passage, starting in verse 1, Ahaziah has a fall that leaves him severely injured. And he responds by sending messengers to call for Baal, um, Beelzebub, on whether he'll recover. And God responds by sending Elijah to meet these messengers and tell them that the Lord says that he will not get out of bed and he's going to die. So yet again, this message from Elijah, this is not a light, soft message. This is a message of severity. And yet again, we see the severity of God in action with God's response when Ahaziah is looking in all the wrong, all the wicked places, instead of looking to God for a little bit of guidance as he's suffered this injury. And Ahaziah's messengers return that message to him, and Ahaziah asks what the man looked like who said these things. And I think this is a really, really interesting thing to read. I'm going to start reading in verse 5. The messengers returned to the king, and he said to them, Why have you returned? And they said to him, There came a man to meet us and said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you were sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron? Therefore you shall not come up down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. He said to them, What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, I think this is just amazing. And he said, It is a lie of the Tishbite. It's like he knew. And you can almost sense with the family history there, there was this moment where it was like, oh no. Please tell me it's not this guy again. Please tell me that it is not Elijah again. I can imagine this moment he probably feels a little bit of anger. Think about it. There's a lot of family history here. A little bit of fear. When Elijah comes along, bad things happen to my family. (laughs) Not good things. And I can almost imagine definitely that he thought to himself, oh no. um, I need to stop this guy. He needs to be dead. So Guess what he's going to do? Ahaziah's response is to hunt down Elijah with a captain of 50 men. And Elijah responds by saying, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Which, guess what? As it always does with God protecting Elijah, that happens. God destroys these men with fire. Essentially burns them all up. And guess what? Ahaziah says, If I failed once, I'm going to try the same thing again. He tries the same exact strategy again. And guess what? Same result. These people come before Elijah, they ask him to come on down, and he, they are destroyed with fire. The severity of God was unleashed on these men who were just carrying out a duty from the king. Oh, but they were just doing their job. They were just doing as they were told. We can see here this is obviously not an excuse to, to be carrying out evil, and this was not, it did not excuse them from God's severity. And there is a lesson for here for us that we'll touch on in just a moment. But then a third time, 
Ahaziah says, I'm going, to send, I'm going to send 50 people with a captain again to get Elijah. He tries it again, and this time the third captain with his 50 men fell on his knees before Elijah and begged for their lives to be spared. And I think that it's important for us to read. I want you to read this. I want you to listen to his words. Again, the king sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50. This is in verse 13. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and entreated him, O man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord in this moment is going to tell Elijah to go down. Go down to this captain who has just made this statement. Not be afraid of him. And God, in this instance, he is showing his goodness. He spares this man in his 50. I think there's a couple things to look at here. And as we look at the faith shown by Elijah, yet again, yet again, God has told him, you need to go down. And what does Elijah do? He doesn't. He doesn't ask questions. He goes. One, he, he, a show of his faith was that he trusted God, that it was safe for him to come down. And two, I think there would have been this feeling of justice that Elijah wanted to destroy these men, get rid of these guys. This is awful what they are coming here to do to me. And like I said, here we see the goodness of God in action right on the heels of his severity. God's shown his severity by destroying those other two groups that came to get Elijah. This third one comes in the face of the severity and this man, this captain of these third group of 50 men, he's seen what has just happened to these people who probably might have been close colleagues or maybe people that they had known for a long time. And in the face of this severity, that captain, he said, kind of like Ahab, I'm going to humble myself before God. Please spare me. And Elijah at this moment goes with the captain after he's been spared and goes to Ahaziah and delivers the same message that he gave to the messengers from God. You shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And what happens, as it always does with God's prophecies, Ahaziah dies. And Jehoram becomes king because Ahaziah had no son. As we move into the life applications from this section, yet again, I want to, I want to hit a few life applications that don't necessarily apply to the goodness and severity of God because there are some really good points in this one as well. The first one is seeking answers and direction from worldly sources like King Ahaziah did um, oftentimes result, ends in poor worldly results. We see that from Ahab too. Uh, we've seen that in Ahab's life. We've seen that here with Ahaziah. But we really do need to be careful in our lives of the counsel that we seek the very first place that I should be going is obviously the Word of God. Then the second place that you probably need to be looking is to another, a fellow Christian, someone who is wise, who is really in the Word a lot, someone who understands the Word, and so on and so forth. And make sure that the counsel that you seek in your life is from a good source. And Because if you start seeking counsel in, in unrighteous places you're going to end up getting unrighteous answers. And I think that that is a really, really important lesson, um, I think, for younger people, too, um, that, that we need to be very aware of. Another life application from this count is simply carrying out the sinful task of another person does not excuse us of the sin. There's no excuse for being the second-hand sinner, as I call it here. Sin is sin, period. If you are committing a sin, then you are committing a sin. It doesn't matter who puts you up to it. Um, we all have the ability to do as the third captain did and say no. Say, no, I'm not going to do this, and turn to God. Fear of force is not an excuse. Fear of being fired is not an excuse. Fear of losing something is not an excuse. It's always going to pay off to take the stand. Now, in this life, physically, maybe not. Maybe not. But I can assure you in the life to come, taking the stand is worth it. And another life application is sometimes the Lord is going to ask us to go down with him. Do not be afraid with him. Yet again, will we trust God in these moments? Time and time and time we see Elijah do this. And we talked about this earlier. And the question for us is, will we? And I, I think there's a really, really powerful... There, there's something powerful in so many of these passages. And in, in, in 2 Kings here, in chapter 1, verse 4, at the end of this, you know, God tells him, you need to go and you need to tell King Hazai this. And to me, one of the most powerful sentences in this account is at the end of verse 4. So Elijah went... Three words, but very simple, not 
Elijah asked God all these questions. Elijah said, I don't want to. So Elijah went. And we see that so often in the life of Elijah. In the face of all these things that would be very scary every single time. So Elijah went. Now I do want to shift gears to the severity and the goodness of God again from this account. And these life applications should look familiar because yet again, all of these apply to this account and yet again, they apply to our lives today. Yet again, the severity of God is seen in the presence of sin. God's severity is seen in how he would punish the wicked man that was Ahaziah and those who stood for him. We, we saw this was a wicked man. We read at the end of 1 Kings, Ahaziah, he took over the throne. It is not a good situation. And he is an evil and wicked man. And guess what? The severity of God is seen in how God predicted that these awful things were going to come to pass in his life. Yet again, God's judgment is one of severity. It is not light. God is telling Ahaziah that he will die on his deathbed, never to recover. I mean, that's pretty serious. That's pretty grim. And then he destroys those who stood for this purpose in seeking out Elijah. The severity of God is seen in action here. Not only from the king, but those who serve him. God's judgment is not light. It is severe. And yet again, the severity of God causes change. The third captain had seen God's severity in action. He had seen all these people destroyed before him. And what did it do? It caused a change of heart. Humility. Humility in the face of the power and wrath of the Almighty God. And sometimes we need that. Sometimes those around us need to see this. Sometimes God's severity is extremely necessary when we are trying to get to the hearts of those around us in the world. And off the heels of the severity of God causing change, yet again in this account we see the goodness of God is seen in the presence of a humble heart. God spares this group of men after their captain shows this humility and begs Elijah for their lives. And one last time, yet again, the goodness of God is truly felt in the presence of his severity. From group one and group two of soldiers who were destroyed to group three who were spared, we see just how good God can be in the wake of his severity. The power of this account here, because obviously we see the severity of God and the punishment that comes on Ahaziah, but the power of the goodness of God here is seen from one group to the next to the next. Through what? Through his severity. God destroys those first two groups. And what makes the third group being spared so powerful? That we are immediately following up the destruction of the other two. The goodness of God is truly felt in the presence of his sincerity. And I hope that's something that we, that we don't lose, that we don't lose sight of and we don't lose the power of um, from these accounts. There's one other slide that I have after this. It's kind of a, a final thought on the goodness and severity of God that really applies to the life that we're living today and the culture that we're in today and we find ourselves in today. Um, before we go there, does anybody have any questions, comments, things that they want to say? Um, anybody have any comments at this time? Yeah. And as you said, not the going was not easy. But Elijah also had the benefit of remembering what God had done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we're in that situation, it seems we seem very isolated and we don't always remember what God did. Yeah. So so much of the Old Testament was filled with God wanting his people to remember what he had done for them. Yep. And sometimes it's really easy for us just to forget. Yep. And, we get, and then the fear paralyzes us and we don't go. Yep. We, we lose sight of all the times that God's provided in the past. I, I brought up this song yesterday in the faithfulness class, but there's a song, The Goodness of God, that says, All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And we lose track of that. We, we do. We lose sight of that so often. And it, and it makes it... It helps to be able to go like Elijah did when I can recall the way that God has been faithful in my life in the past. That was a good comment. Anything else before we go to our last little point here? All right, good deal. So I do want to make a final thought and just present a final thought on you, uh, to you on the goodness and the severity of God. And when I was making this lesson, it, it, 
as I went through it, and I told, I told Aaron this, that as I was preparing this, I'd never really thought about e- either of these chapters um, in the context of contrasting and looking at how the goodness and the severity of God go together. But by the end of this study, as I was making this, I thought to myself, wow, this is so relevant. <laughs> this is so relevant to the culture we're in today, especially the religious world. The religious world so desperately desires to change who God is by taking away his severity. You know what I'm talking about. I, I don't have to tell you. I, I, kind of, I kind of alluded to it earlier. The religious world around us today so desperately wants to take away God's severity. Only the goodness of God, only the goodness of God. And kind of like I brought up earlier, his faithfulness is kind of stolen if you take his severity because his severity is part of who he is because he upholds his standard. And when you don't uphold his standard, there has to be consequences. You might say, Carson, that's not fair. I don't make the rules. God does. And so many around us today so desperately want to take away God's severity. You know why? Because severity is not popular. Severity doesn't get people in the door. Severity is not accepting of every lifestyle. When what we see in contrast with that, what we actually see when we look at the characteristics of God in Scripture is that they're actually taking away His goodness. When they take away God's severity and they try to remove God's severity, they're taking away His goodness and His faithfulness and who He is. Because the goodness of God is truly seen in the presence of His severity. I've said that a few times tonight. The goodness of God is truly seen in the presence of His severity. And you know what? We have all been guilty of deserving His severity. Every single one of us. But you know what? In that moment, in that statement, in that fact, that we have all been guilty of deserving God's severity... This is where we truly see His goodness, though. This is where we truly see His goodness through His grace, His mercy, and His love shown to us through the blood of His Son that makes forgiveness and salvation that I do not deserve because of my sin against Him attainable. God's severity, it causes change. We've seen that in a few, a few times in, the, in these passages. God's severity causes change. It's a powerful tool. Of God's. It is. It's a powerful tool of His. Do not cheapen it. Use it in your own life, in your own walk. I'm not talking about just evangelizing to others. In your own walk, never lose sight of the severity of God. Never lose sight of the severity of God. Acknowledge it. And in the lives of others, sometimes it's necessary. Bring it to their attention. Because in the face of that severity, hopefully they will see His goodness. And hopefully you will see His goodness as well in your life every day. I've said a few times in Bible classes and sermons and whatnot that the world and the culture around us, including the religious world and culture around us, so desperately wants to knock us off platform and remove us from what we see in this book, the truth. And you know what? It's popular to serve a God who only shows goodness. (laughs) But I don't know about you, but I, I... I don't know, the question we need to ask ourselves is this. When I study God's Word and I see the standard that He has set, would you want a God to serve a God who never punished anybody for anything? I'm thankful for a God who sets standards. I'm thankful for a God who sets morals. I'm thankful for a God who has shown us the way to Him through His Son. And as we go through our lives, and as we grow as a congregation, and as even if, you know, no matter where your life takes you, whatever congregation you're a part of, and as the world tries and pulls us further and further away to worship this God who, the God they want us to worship does not exist, this God that only shows His goodness, I hope that we are able to rest and in, in stand upon the truth that is founded in who God actually is. And I hope that you can see God's goodness 
in his severity. And I hope that that is the message that we can take to the world around us, that God's goodness is really seen in his severity. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Um, looking forward to, to next week. We'll be talking about the passing of the mantle, um, Elijah to Elisha. So look forward to that study with you all. Thank you.